Hey guys, it's Cosmic Skeptic, and it's come to the end of the year, uh, and it's been about three years since I last did a book recommendations video. And it's one of the most requested videos that I ever get, and I always say that I'll get round to it, but it actually does take a lot of time to try and compile everything that I've read and put it into a form of uh, recommended uh, books. I don't want to include everything that I've read if I don't think it's useful or I didn't enjoy it. Um, but I thought that the end of the year would be a good time to do it and focus mainly on books that I've read in the previous year, in 2000. And 19, um, but also maybe throw in a few things that I think have been really important in my reading since my last video. If you haven't seen the original video, I'll link it in the description. Um, it was kind of a, a basic book introduction, things like the God delusion, God is not great. If you're kind of new to atheism and uh, science enthusiasm and that kind of stuff, it was kind of stuff I was reading getting into that, uh, th those kinds of topics. But um, over the past few years, especially since going to university, um, I've been really trying to expand my reading on all areas like philosophy and science and even fiction now, would you believe it? Uh, and I thought that I'd make this video just giving you some recommendations and talking about some of the things that I've been reading. And if you support me on Patreon, then look out for a bookshelf tour that I'm going to film quite soon. It's something that some of you have asked for over on Patreon. And I wanted to make some content as a kind of thanks to my patrons, my supporters over there. Um, but I didn't want to make any private content. I didn't want to make like a normal video and make it only for patrons because I never want anything to be behind a paywall. But I think that just showing you around uh, the books that I've got here in the recording space, the books that I've got at home and the books that I take to university would be quite interesting. Um, it won't be recommendations, but just showing you the books that I own, including a bunch of signed books and special books and first prints and old books. So if you're interested in that, then uh, you can support me on Patreon if you want to see the video, um, but also consider supporting me on Patreon if you like the content anyway. Um, it's really what keeps the channel going. But yeah, as a thanks, uh, look out for that because that's going to be hell to film as well, given just how many books I own. But to kick things off, I want to address the elephant in the room first, which is that obviously over the past year, uh, I've been talking a lot about animal ethics. It's something that I never spoke about in the past, not really anyway, except for an odd mention or maybe an odd video. Um, but over the past year, of course, I became a vegan, uh, which I consider to be one of the biggest life changes that I've made ever in my entire life. Um, and philosophically speaking, there is a lot of literature that we can be reading, um, especially because I know that a lot of my viewers are perhaps people who are interested in philosophy and willing to read those kinds of books, but maybe haven't engaged with specifically animal ethics before. Now, if you've been watching my channel at all, you'll know that the first book on the list is going to be Animal Liberation by Peter Singer. This is essentially the book that made me go vegan. Um, I'd say that if you don't want to read the whole thing, it's not that big of a book, but it is quite dense. The first chapter, it's only 20 pages long, is kind of a philosophical case uh, for the equal uh, moral consideration of animals. And that's what really got me. The rest is kind of a, 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 an expose of factory farming and uh, animal testing and things like that. Uh, but the first chapter is a really important one for me. In fact, a bunch of people that I know personally, I said to them, that I'll buy them the book, uh, some friends of mine. I've, I've offered this to a few people, and I said, I'll buy the book for you if only you promise to read just the first chapter. It's only about 20 pages. Um, something like five or six people have taken me up on the offer, and I bought them the book, and they read the chapter, and every single one of them, every single one of them went vegan or is trying veganism without fail. This book just works absolute wonders. Um, but don't be scared to read it. You'll feel a lot better after you have done. And since we're talking about Peter Singer, he's got a wealth of books that you can read. Um, if you want to read some short essays that he's written, Ethics in the Real World is quite good. It's, it's just kind of uh, practical ethics, a, a few pages, maybe one or two pages per essay. You've got titles like um, Does Anything Matter? Are We Ready for a Morality Pill? Um, Cultural Bias Against Whaling? Consider the turkey, thoughts for Thanksgiving. So, you know, just specific things, Some a lot on animal ethics again, but also other, other issues too. Peter Singer is also the author of Practical Ethics, which is essentially a textbook for uh, students of ethics. It, it's on most uh, ethics courses, I believe. It certainly is at my university when you do the Practical Ethics module. Um, again, just a, a great overview if you're into practical ethics. It's been a little while since I've read it, but I also remember enjoying The Expanding Circle, Ethics and Sociobiology by... Uh, by Peter Singer again. Um, this is a book about evolutionary explanations for altruistic behavior, right? It makes sense when you think about natural selection for organisms to be nice perhaps to our family members because they share some of our genes, right? But why would we be nice to people of different races? Why would we be nice to people who come from different areas of the world, for instance? And indeed, why would we be nice 
to non-human animals. It seems like it's it's an odd evolutionary logic there, but Singer explains or makes at least a strong case um, for how we can explain that evolutionarily. Interestingly, Richard Dawkins disagrees with the view, which uh, you can hear about when I uh, spoke to Richard Dawkins on the Cosmic Skeptic podcast. We briefly mentioned The Expanding Circle by Peter Singer, but that's the book we were talking about. Now, like I say, I've been reading a lot of animal rights literature more broadly, um, and it's not just Peter Singer, believe it or not. Um, if you want something a bit more hardcore, let's say, then Animal Rights, The Abolitionist Approach by Gary Francioni and Anna Charlton is quite good. It's very short, um, essentially making what might be called an extremist case for, for a vegan lifestyle. You know, they argue against having pets. They argue against any kind of exploitation of animals, no matter what the circumstances are. So it's interesting to read, even if just uh, to see how much you disagree with the kind of extremist version of the view. But if you want something on the other end of the spectrum, uh, Eating Animals Should We Stop by Jonathan I think Safran Foa, I think is how you say it. It's the guy that wrote Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. He wrote this book about factory farming and uh, farming on kind of backyard farms and this kind of thing. He did a lot of research and went and visited a lot of these places and it, it's a lot more mild. It doesn't kind of, it's not in your face saying you need to go vegan and stop eating animals. It's uh, it does ultimately conclude that factory farming, at least, is awful, uh, but it kind of left the author at, at the end of the book um, with, a, with a newfound respect for backyard farming and things like that. So you kind of got an extreme book over here for veganism and a little more relaxed book over here as well, but both are really good to read. If you want a book that's a bit more matter of fact, just kind of facts and points about uh, the animal industry, there's a good book called Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows by Melanie Joy. Um, it's called an, an Introduction to Carnism. It essentially tries to identify uh, an ideology, a tacit ideology uh, that she calls carnism um, that is kind of within our media, within the way we eat, within the way we talk, within our language, um, but also just tells you all about uh, the conditions on factory farms and in animal testing and this kind of thing. So it's, it's worth reading that as well. If you're more of a fan of shorter essays, then there's a good collection you can read called uh, In Defense of Animals. It's edited by Peter Singer, but the essays aren't written by him. Uh, it's a collection of all kinds of philosophers talking on everything from the basic kind of points about animal equality through to factory farming and uh, animal testing, also justifications for different methods of animal rights advocacy and how far uh, we should be able to go in terms of that kind of advocacy. So again, if, you're, if you want to read something that's a bit more broken up, then that might be the book for you. Now, moving on to philosophy more broadly, uh, in the past year, one of the most recent books that I've been reading, I haven't finished it yet, is David Benneter's book on antinatalism. It's called Better Never to Have Been. Um, especially after talking about veganism, a lot of people have asked me to talk about antinatalism. If you're not familiar, it's the view that it's immoral to have children. Um, it's an interesting book. I want to make a video on it. That's, that's one of the reasons why I'm reading the book, um, because I had some misunderstandings about what the theory actually entailed, what it actually said. Um, it's kind of compelling and interesting, not overwhelmingly compelling. It's like you can see the point he's making, but uh, it's a really interesting application of the idea that we should minimize unnecessary suffering. If that's something you believe, as I do, David Benneter tries to kind of take that to a logical extension, he sees it, uh, because the way to, of course, minimize unnecessary suffering is to not allow that suffering to take place at all by not allowing anybody to have any children. Um, but it's not quite as simple as it might seem on face value. So I'd recommend giving it a read, but it's a bit more kind of niche. It might not be up everybody's street, but uh, look out for a video on that hopefully sometime in the future when I finish the book, if I feel like I've got enough to say on the topic. Also, I believe published this year, maybe at the tail end of last year, um, A.C. Grayling's book, uh, The History of Philosophy. He's kind of styling himself after Bertrand Russell's History of Western Philosophy. Um, it's very comprehensive. It does just what it says on the tin, has you know, a few pages on uh, all the kind of key thinkers throughout history. And one of the things that it does that not a lot of um, Western books on the history of philosophy does is tries to also incorporate Eastern philosophy at the end. Although A.C. Grayling recognizes that he's not an expert on Eastern philosophy, but he still makes an attempt to include it uh, as part of his history. Um, if you want to kind of learn about thinkers rather than necessarily ideas, um, and you want to go through the history that way, then I'd really recommend it. And you don't need to read it, of course, all the way through if you just want to 
have it as kind of a reference book. If someone mentions a philosopher and you want to just have a brief overview of what they think, then uh, it's a fantastic place to go. And it's obviously brand new. So it includes uh, modern philosophy as well from like the 20th century, etc. Um, yeah, I'd really recommend picking that up, even if just having it as a reference book on a shelf somewhere. I've also been recently digging into the essays of George Orwell. Um, again, you can buy them in a collection. I, I, there, I'm sure there are loads of versions that you can buy online. Um, but George Orwell was obviously one of the most important political commentators of the 20th century. And although he's renowned for his fiction, uh, he also wrote a, a ton of essays. And all of them are, are interesting, not always particularly convincing, sometimes a little bit troubling, actually, I found. Um, but again, just really interesting to read and, and worth having in your uh, mental catalogue. But I'll also add that when it comes to political philosophy, uh, the reason I'm not really making any recommendations now is because I'm going to be doing a module on political philosophy. It's theory of politics as a part of philosophy uh, at university. I don't know exactly when I'm doing it, but I feel like after I've done that module, it's probably going to be a better time for me to recommend political theory and especially an order in which to read it. So perhaps after I've done the actual paper at university, I'll make some more recommendations. But for now, I think I'll leave political philosophy there. One thing that I've been trying to do more this year as well is reading memoirs. Um, I was always a bit skeptical of reading them. I enjoyed, uh, when I was younger, reading, for instance, Ayaan Hirsi Ali's, uh, when I heard about her story and thought it was relevant to criticizing Islam and things, but I was always wary to just read a memoir just to learn about a person. Um, but it is, of course, an enriching thing to do. I, I, I'm very, you might be able to tell from the recommendations that I'm making. When I read, I tend to do it because I think it's going to be useful. Um, a lot of people think I like reading, by the way. Everyone seems to think that I'm really into reading. I, I hate reading. I like having read. Um, I see it like going to the gym. It's like mental exercise, right? I don't actually enjoy the process of reading unless I'm reading like a fun book, I guess. But I don't do that too regularly. Um, so that's one of the things I do with memoirs. Uh, oftentimes I'm not actually enjoying it. I just want to get to know a person. Uh, so I read some of uh, Malcolm X's biography. Again, that wasn't this year, that was a while ago. Um, but I remember that being, of course, it's a classic and it's, it's worth picking up. Um, I also read a, a memoir called Trans. I can't remember if there was a tagline to it and I can't remember who it was by, but I'll have a picture just here. Um, I didn't actually like reading it too much. I, I didn't think it was written particularly well, came across as a little bit pretentious at some points. Um, but it was really interesting to get inside the experiences, inside the mind of somebody uh, who is not uh, accepted by society for the fact that they're transgender. Um, you can really kind of feel the feel the pain of the book, but it's also quite optimistic in many ways. And I think it's probably worth reading. Another memoir that I read this year, sorry to be so depressing, uh, was William Styron's Darkness Visible. Um, I say depressing, I mean, this book, this memoir is about depression. It kind of put depression on the map, right? When Styron was writing, not many people really knew what it was or were taking it very seriously. And this book helped a lot of people. Um, you've probably already heard of it. Uh, but I finally got around to reading it. And uh, it's actually not a depressing book in the sense that it kind of is a story of his escape from suicide, I suppose. Um, so if depression is something that you are struggling with or have struggled with, or if you're just interested in learning about it, which I think everybody should be, because I think that everybody knows somebody at least who's been through it or is going through it, then this book can really help kind of elucidate um, what these people are feeling. Because the thing about depression, uh, as far as I understand from Styron, at least this is his view, that it's always just impossible to put into words what the feeling is actually like. I think that's something we can all relate to, having those feelings that just are ineffable. We just can't seem to find the words. But Styron, being such an excellent writer, manages it better than most people would be able to. So it's definitely uh, a recommended book for that kind of reading. I'm always also dipping into and rereading the memoirs and writings of Christopher Hitchens. Um, I've been really enjoying reading the earlier parts of Hitch 22, his memoir that he wrote uh, nearing the end of his life. Uh, reading about the parts when he was young and studying at Oxford, because now being at that university and getting to go to the places and recognizing places that he mentions in the book. Um, it's, it's quite an eerie and, and bizarre, but really interesting experience, like frequenting the pub uh, where he met James Fenton for the first time. It's just things like that that are, that are really interesting to live out. But as well as Hitch 22, which is kind of the obvious memoir to read of Hitchens, um, one of my favorite books, I think perhaps my favorite book he ever read is Letters to a Young Contrarian. Again, it's the kind of book that I tend to dip in and out of rather than sit and read all the way through. But uh, that book is just... I don't know if it's like objectively good, so to speak. I wouldn't recommend it to everybody. Um, but if you're into debate and arguing and into Hitchens kind of way of thinking and way of going about the world, then Letters to a Young Contrarian feels like it's written to you. feels like it's written as a kind of rallying cry to, to carry on uh, the kind of thinking and kind of argumentative prowess that he, uh, that he paved the way for. So I'd recommend those two 
uh, to start with. Now, if you saw my previous book recommendations video three years ago, then you may remember that I recommended Mortality by Christopher Hitchens, which was the last book that he ever wrote. Um, he wrote it as he was dying of esophageal cancer. And the interesting thing about that book, of course, is that you get to be inside of the mind of somebody who's dying, right? Something we'll, of course, all get to experience, but at the time, I don't think we'll be particularly interested in uh, engaging with the philosophy around what it's like to die. Um, and that's where we turn to literature. And there are some really interesting insights you can get from that kind of book. Um, another book that I read, uh, I don't think it was this year, maybe last year, was a book called When Breath Becomes Air. Um, it was a bestseller, so you may have heard of it, but it was written by a doctor um, who was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And uh, again, it, it was just a fantastic insight of what it's like to just have that completely world-crushing uh, realization that everything you have is going to be coming to an end. Um, it, it's a hell of a ride. It's, it's not easy reading. Of course, it's quite emotionally heavy, especially at the end. Um, but I think it's worth reading just to kind of sober ourselves to the realities of life and existence on this planet. And there are lots of other kind of depressive uh, classic works that you can read about death uh, and suicide particularly. I mean, the classic text on suicidality would be Albert Camus' Myth of Sisyphus, of course. Um, I kind of can't not mention this if I'm talking about the subject. I didn't find it particularly compelling, but it's quite optimistic. Uh, might be a good place to start with that kind of stuff. Um, you can also read uh, Arthur Schopenhauer's essays. Um, he, there's a collection you can get called Essays in Pessimism, I think. Uh, that's the one that I read anyway. Uh, it's a hell of a read. He has an essay on suicide, that's why I mention it, and again, it's very kind of forthright, it's quite striking in that, like, if you read a lot of, uh, if, if you try and look at philosophy of suicide uh, today, especially if you do it online, if you type in a philosophical question like, is life worth living, something like that, then you're not going to get very far because you're just going to be bombarded with phone numbers and, and go here if you need help, that kind of thing, but uh, reading something like Schopenhauer's essays, it's just totally uh, naked and sober and just tells you what he thinks without any kind of, without any kind of warning. Um, but the collection itself is also very interested because a lot of it is very lucid and very, um, it, it can be quite upsetting it can, because, because it's like powerfully argued, but in a very, uh, as it says on the tin, a very pessimistic uh, manner. Um, but there's also kind of in the middle of this, uh, of this quite brilliant uh, collection of essays is an essay that he wrote called Of Women. Um, and it's just one of the most sexist, misogynistic things you could possibly read in the English language. Um, to the extent, in fact, that in my version of Essays in Pessimism, in the editor's introduction, it says at the end, oh, by the way, uh, the essay on women isn't a joke. He wasn't joking. He, was, he wasn't doing satire. Like, he was actually being deadly serious uh, because it's, it's just that bad. Uh, so if you want to get a kick out of something, then, uh, then that, that's a good thing you can read. Um, but the essays surrounding it in that collection are also very, very good. And by the way, when I say that something is good when I'm talking about philosophy, I don't necessarily mean that I agree with it, that I subscribe to it, that I think it's um, a, a good philosophy to follow. I just mean that it's it's good for um, engaging with, with those kinds of topics. So if you're interested in engaging with the philosophy of whether or not life is worth living, which you may be if you read something like Benetton's book um, on antinatalism, that kind of stuff. If that's the kind of thing you're interested in, then these books are good for that. I'm not necessarily saying that they are good in their conclusions, if you see what I'm saying. In Schopenhauer's essay on suicide, he also uh, references David Hume's essay on suicide, which talks about some of the uh, religious angles to suicide as well. So uh, if you want your kind of suicide literature recommendation from Cosmic Skeptic, uh, The Myth of Sisyphus, um, Arthur Schopenhauer's essay on suicide, David Hume's uh, essay, but I'd also recommend reading um, some of the modern literature that argues, should we say, to the contrary. Um, I remember reading Matt Haig's book, Reasons to Stay Alive. That was a, that was a good book. Um, he's got a lot of books on uh, anxiety and depression and things like that, which I think are quite interesting. I've also been trying to read a bit more fiction um, as of late, because as I say earlier, I, I don't tend to read for pleasure. I tend to read uh, because I think it's useful. It's a useful thing to do. Um, and even with fiction, sometimes I, I'm reading it uh, not because I actually enjoy the process of reading it, but because some of the kind of the morals you can get from the story, some of the experiences you can feel that you've had from reading a great novel um, can be useful, even if I'm not enjoying the process of actually reading it. Um, I just finished reading Lolita by Nabokov, which is one of the most beautifully written things I've ever uh, I've ever laid eyes upon. It's also, of course, very disturbing, but also hilariously funny. Um, I recommended it. It quickly became one of my favorite novels that I've ever read, let alone just in this year. Earlier in the year, I also read uh, Martin Amos's The Rachel Papers. Um, I wanted to read some of Martin Amos, partly, I guess, on Christopher Hitchens's influence. 
Uh, but the Rachel Papers was the first novel he ever wrote, so I thought I'd start there. And again, it was just hilarious, I found. And you'll find yourself raising your eyebrows at one or two points during the plot line. Um, but the author's very self-aware about these things, and it's it's quite entertaining to read. For my degree for theology uh, over the past year, I also got to dip into some of the novels of Dostoevsky, um, specifically The Brothers Karamazov. I ended up writing an essay on that book uh, for my first year exam. It kind of goes without saying that these are great books that everyone should read, but I just wanted to give them a mention because it's something that I have been reading this year um, and did find it as good as everybody says that they are. But whilst people always understandably recommend Dostoevsky's big, great novels, um, they often do so at the expense of some of the stuff that he wrote before, uh, my favourite being Notes from the Underground. So uh, if you're looking for something a little bit shorter, it's about 100 pages long, I'd recommend that as a good starting point for Dostoevsky. At least that's where I... Uh, began to read his works. And you can tell how loosely I read fiction with how erratic all of these books are. Um, but another book that springs to mind when I think about fiction is The Catcher in the Rye. That's one that I read since the last video I made. And again, is probably one of my favorite novels. I just really enjoyed it. I can't quite put my finger on why. Um, but again, I, th I think it was quite funny. I, I tend to have an appreciation for books uh, where the author is, is self-aware and ironic and kind of subtly humorous in, in, a, in an otherwise serious book, let's say. That's probably my favorite kind of fiction book. So, in fact, if any of you have any recommendations uh, for fiction books that you think I might enjoy based on the kind of books that I've been talking about here, then feel free to leave some in the comments. I'd, I'd love to hear them, or also on Goodreads. Um, I should have mentioned at the beginning, I have a Goodreads account if you're interested in keeping up to date with what I'm reading when I'm reading it. Uh, goodreads.com forward slash cosmic skeptic if you're interested you can send me some requests there I'm sure I'm not really sure how it works but I'm sure there's a way to do it now of course I've been doing a lot of reading for my actual degree I study philosophy and theology um, and usually the stuff that I'm reading are like very specific essays they're very uh, very specific to, to something that I'm studying at the time they're not particularly interesting general philosophical reading but there are some books that have either stuck out or have been uh, reoccurring and so are useful reference books on the theology front one of the most important books that I read in my first year of university was a book by Daniel Powell called Nine Theories of Religion, um, which does do what it says on the tin. It kind of takes nine really important key thinkers uh, when it comes to the sociology of religion, the psychology of religion, explaining why people are religious, essentially, uh, and goes through them all quite comprehensively, um, but also quite briskly. So if you're looking for a good introduction to the explanations of religion from people like Karl Marx, from people like Emil Durkheim, um, from people like Sigmund Freud, then this is a really good book to start with. I've also really enjoyed doing the science and religion paper that I'm still kind of halfway through at the moment at university, um, getting to read uh, Galileo's works, and they were interesting enough to make me make a video about it, as, as you'll know if you're a subscriber. Uh, made a video about Galileo's trial, I'll link that in the description. Um, also getting to read Charles Darwin, uh, not just kind of the origin of species, but also some of his personal correspondence to see about his views on religion and how evolution uh, and his theory of natural selection kind of played into religion and what the response was at the time. Uh, we did a bit of Stephen Jay Gould's non-overlapping magisterium type stuff. We also went back to Isaac Newton and kind of uh, read a bunch of literature discussing uh, whether or not he kind of removed the need for God as an explanation for the universe. But again, with these kinds of things, when it comes to like reading Newton and Darwin and that kind of stuff, uh, it tends to just be their correspondence and their big kind of magnum opus. So, you know, um, reading about the Principia uh, Mathematica, reading The Origin of Species, uh, reading the correspondence that they wrote relevant to religion. It, it's fairly easy stuff to find online. You know, I, uh, what I might do is upload my reading lists to my website. I previously did that for... Uh, some of the stuff that I did in first year, I uploaded some of the reading lists that I got given. I might try and update that in the future. If that's something you want to see, let me know. I can post uh, essentially what my tutors send me. They email me a bunch of reading each week uh, for a particular topic. Um, so I can put that on my website, perhaps with their permission, if that's something that you want to see. Now, just thinking about it, I remember that at the end of the last book recommendation video that I did, I mentioned a few books that I wanted to read. Uh, one of which being Infidel by Ian Hersey Ali, which I've already mentioned, um, which I did, of course, read and I thought was fantastic. Um, just thought I'd update you on that front since I mentioned it in the last one. Uh, I definitely would recommend that. I think the other one I mentioned was Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, which was just fantastic. I mean, it's it's one of these books that everyone says is one of the kind of best books written in, in recent years. And I think it deserves the credit that it's getting. And also the sequel to that, Homo Deus, which I haven't read yet, uh, but I've heard is equally good. 
And on the topic of books that I haven't read, I had some requests on Twitter when I mentioned that I was going to make this video to talk about some of the books that I want to read that I've got kind of on my list that I haven't read yet. So uh, there are a few that spring to mind. There's one book that was recommended to me quite a long time ago now by Steve Woodford, Rationality Rules, um, called Justice by Michael Sandel. Um, I've seen one or two of the lectures that he's given. I think if you type in Harvard University into YouTube, he's, his lecture is the first one that comes up. Um, I've heard that it's very good, and I've got it on good authority since uh, I trust Steve and his philosophical recommendations, um, and I hope that you'll trust them too, so I might see if I can find the time to read that if I get the chance. It looks really interesting. I also really want to read Dominion by Tom Holland. Um, this more or less comes at the recommendation of Justin Brierley, whose show you may have seen uh, on my channel. He runs the Christian radio show Unbelievable that I've been on a few times. It's where I debated Frank Turek, uh, but he recently had Tom Holland on debating, I think, A.C. Grayling about uh, the influence of Christianity and the development of Western culture, essentially. Tom Holland tries to make the case that Christianity has been absolutely crucial in shaping the values uh, that we have in Western liberal uh, democracies. And I've heard that it's quite a compelling case. So I want to give that a read and, and see what I have to think about it. I'm trying to think of books that have been actually kind of recommended in some way or another, because I want to be on some kind of authority uh, that I can recommend books that I haven't actually read yet. Um, and I'm, the last one that I can think of is... <laughs> comes from the recommendation of none other than Jordan Peterson, who I saw speak in Oxford um, at the tail end of last year, in October, I think. And he tends to just kind of talk from the top of his head. And this event wasn't filmed, so I don't know if he's mentioned this book anywhere else, but he, he mentioned Ordinary Men. Um, I can't remember who it's by, but I believe this book is about soldiers guarding Nazi death camps and uh, essentially kind of exploring the psychology of these individuals who, as the title says, are just ordinary people, you know, they're, they're just people, uh, but somehow were capable of committing these, these atrocities. Uh, that seems like a really interesting psychological investigation. Um, and as soon as he mentioned it, I think I pulled my phone out in the theater and, and noted it down because uh, for all that Jordan Peterson has to say, um, his book recommendations tend to be pretty on point. Now, Chris Guck one asks an interesting question on Twitter, um, which is, if I've read any books in the past year specifically to try and challenge myself, challenge my views, I assume, in relation to uh, religion specifically. And yeah, of course, I'm always trying to do that. And there are, again, a few that kind of immediately spring to mind. Uh, one that I'm currently reading, again, I haven't finished it, is The Case for Christ. Uh, it was gifted to me by a friend who I met at university. We had a conversation about Christianity, late kind of night conversation type thing. Um, and then, you know, the next day or, or the day after, I found in my little pigeonhole a copy of The Case for Christ with a little note telling me to read it. And I thought that was a very, uh, very kind thing to do. So I've only just finally gotten around to reading it. Sorry, Sam, uh, by the way, for not having read it yet. And I appreciate you lending it to me. I've actually been quite enjoying it. Um, it's written from a journalistic perspective. Lee Strobel, um, you may have seen the film, uh, was a man who uh, worked for a newspaper and his wife converted to Christianity. And he essentially wanted to go and, and try and disprove the historicity of Jesus uh, as a means of trying to prove to his wife that it just didn't make any sense. But in doing so, he ended up becoming convinced and eventually becoming a Christian. Uh, so yeah, it's been recommended by a few people and I think uh, I got a kick out of the film. So I thought I'd I try the book version too, which alas is a little more serious, but uh, it's still quite enjoyable. I've also of course been getting to read a lot of challenging literature by virtue of the degree that I'm doing. So for instance, on a paper uh, studying the figure of Jesus, I got to study the, the church fathers and read like Augustine and Anselm and Athanasius. And as you can see, like I said before, I ended up making videos uh, on on these people. I made a video uh, just after I finished first year about Athanasius and Anselm specifically. But yeah, I got to read these kind of classic um, theological texts to really try and understand the justifications for some of the doctrines of Christianity. You know, I've been having conversations and, and doing reading at university uh, that may not have kind of convinced me of Christianity, of course, uh, but maybe have, maybe have made me think that it's a bit more internally coherent. You know, I remember arguing about things like, if there is a God, you know, uh, would it be justifiable to punish people in hell, for instance, like eternal punishment? Can that be justified? And I may not any longer be able to say, this is immoral. Um, I might have to say that actually on your worldview, understanding the way that you uh, kind of ascribe a certain moral character or nature to your God, this is actually, this actually makes sense. This is actually in keeping with this kind of version of a moral author or something. Um, so that's been really interesting. But I had to read all sorts of theological texts from uh, Catherine of Siena to Julian of Norwich, 
uh, to William Paley. It's been more confessional rather than apologetic, right? It's not somebody sat trying to make an argument, trying to have a debate. It's just somebody talking about what they think, um, which is maybe a healthier way to approach the debates surrounding religion. But yeah, thank you for watching. Uh, if you've made it this far, uh, let me know some of your own book recommendations in the comments down below. And if I think of any uh, that, that are missing that really deserve inclusion, then I'll probably put a pinned comment or put them in the description or something. But yeah, let's uh, let's get talking about some of the books that we've been reading this year. Special thanks as always to my patrons. Don't forget to subscribe uh, if you're interested in the kind of content that I'm putting out. And I will see you in the next one.